Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Anne's Episcopal Church. It is such a pleasure to have you all with us this morning on this, our July 3rd Sunday, so our Sunday before the uh, celebration tomorrow of uh, our independence as a country and our celebration of our national life together. This is also the uh, ninth proper Sunday after Pentecost, so the uh, fourth Sunday after Pentecost, the uh, uh, ninth proper Sunday in the liturgical year. Let us take a moment now, those of you who are gathered with us in person and those of you who are joining us this morning online, to take a moment to quiet our hearts and our minds and prepare to enter this time of worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings from Holy Scripture. A reading from the Old Testament. <clears throat> Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man in high favor with his master, because <clears throat> by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served as Naaman's, <clears throat> she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten cents of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that if I, I have sent you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. <clears throat> but when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger saying, to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, <clears throat> saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over that spot and cure the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 30. Let us read this responsively by the half verse. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. O oh Lord, my God, I cried out to you. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. Sing to the Lord, you servants of his. For his wrath endures but the twinkling of an eye. Weeping may spend the night. When I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. Then, you're, then you hid your face. I cried to you, O Lord. What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my for a load of 
Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing. reading from the New Testament. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride, for all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let, on, let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those of the family of faith. See what, lar- what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand? It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh to try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them, and mercy upon the Israel of God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. The Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. 
See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, say first say, Peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. I speak to you this morning in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I think I mentioned last week, it might have been the week before, that when I was out uh, a few weeks ago on my journey to St. Louis, I recorded a rather pithy video uh, on the shores of Lake Michigan that by the end of the week didn't feel quite so appropriate to post because of everything going on in society around us. But in that video, I noted that we are in an interesting time in this season after Pentecost. This season after Pentecost, uh, through the end of this uh, liturgical year, provides us with an interesting choice, at least in our current lectionary cycle. On one hand, we can read Old Testament readings that thematically connect with the gospel. So each week, whatever we hear in the Old Testament is, is linked to what we hear in the gospel. Or you can choose a different set of readings, one that kind of moves through the arc of the major narratives and stories of the Old Testament. And it's that track that we are following this year and likely will follow most years. But the, the interesting thing about this particular track is that every so often you have readings that seem to seamlessly cohere either with the gospel reading or with the day and time and location in which you're hearing it. So it's really kind of incredible how serendipitous uh, God is when we hear these readings and we reflect on them within the context of our own day and time. And I bring that up this morning because I think in particular that our reading from Naaman, is, or reading from Second Kings about Naaman, about this commander of the armies, is rather fitting for us to hear in proximity to July 4th. Now, I should note too that 
as Episcopalians, it's rather traditional for us to liturgically mark this time. Even though July 4th is not technically a feast day in our church, we have a long-standing history of marking liturgically this significant event in our national history. And that's not true for all of our brothers and sisters. Early Baptists, especially a group that were in Danbury, Connecticut, were very, very concerned about separation of church and state and wrote to Thomas Jefferson on that issue. And throughout time, many Christians have articulated a vision of the secular state in which we as Christians, alongside myriad other religious folk, can worship and exist and coexist in the United States. But as Episcopalians, we've always had kind of a complicated relationship to that issue. We come fundamentally from a church that is established. The Church of England, England is the national church in England. And so it's worth us thinking about that. And I want to name it at the outset. But I also do want to take an opportunity to liturgically reflect on national identity, on our connection to the nation state, and what it means for us as Christians, what it means for us in the larger context of our lived experience as Christians, and what it means for us as Americans, and who we are as a collective country. And I say that there is a significant connection to the story of Naaman today because I would suggest to you, friends, that we, we as the United States in this day and time, are the Aram, the Aram of Naaman's time. Now, we hear about this kingdom of Aram both in 1 Kings, in the sort of latter half of 1 Kings, and then in this section in 2 Kings. They were the predominant power in that day and time. Aram covered what is today modern Syria and Lebanon and significant parts of Iraq and even southeastern Turkey. So they, they had this large geographic footprint. And as we hear Naaman described, as commander, the kings of the armies of Aram, he was a force to be reckoned with himself. And so this is the person of power, in the place of power, in the country of power, being humbled, being challenged, having his worldview utterly transformed and shifted. I think that is an important thing for us to think about today. So I want to unpack that a little bit more in the next few minutes. But I want to start, I want to start with an issue of civic religion. I say we are Christians in the United States, but I also acknowledge, as Episcopalians especially, we've had this rather tenuous relationship between the church and the state, and a complicated relationship. But it goes even deeper than that. Since almost the inception of our country, we have had a problem with civic religion. Joseph J. Ellis, one of the preeminent scholars of the American Revolution, of colonial America, and of the early years after the establishment of the country, he writes in his excellent book, American Creation, the pivotal moment in the war, and he's talking about the Revolutionary War here, occurred in the winter of 1777 to 78, the locale for this decisive strategic shift was a previously obscure hamlet miles, 20 miles northwest of Philadelphia named Valley Forge, a place enshrined in mythology ever since as a kind of American Gethsemane, where Washington, the American Christ, kneels in prayer amidst blood-stained snow, beseeching the Lord for deliverance. And you might think that that's, you know, rather sort of retrospectively applied to the history, that it is only in a time after 
that we see Washington as this messianic figure. But truth be told, that shift does not happen very long at all after the war is over. A Russian ambassador, cultural ambassador, uh, by some accounts, a Orthodox priest, he was faithfully Eastern Orthodox, maybe even a priest, named Pavel Sviven, travels in the United States between 1806 and 1813, taking copious notes, commenting on his experience of life here. And he notes that we do not worship God or Christ in God as he would envision from his context in Russia, but we instead worship this man, Washington. Because he notes, and this is, remember, in the early 1800s, that if you go into any home, any public house, any place of business, you do not see an image of Christ, but an image of Washington. Go today, just down the road to Washington, D.C., and if you look upon our buildings of governance, what do they resemble but the ancient temples of classical antiquity? We, we, for years, for centuries, have wrestled with this issue of civic religion. But it goes even deeper than that when we think about this connection to Naaman, this connection to Aram, this connection to the story of healing and transformation that we hear from 2 Kings today. Because Naaman comes first to the king of Samaria, but then eventually to Elisha, with this preconceived notion of exactly how this should play out. He thinks he knows all. He has a clear sense in his mind as to what this should look like, what healing looks like, what transformation looks like, what wholeness and restoration for wholeness should look like. He expects Elisha to come out in some grandiose fashion and pronounce a blessing over him to pronounce some sort of healing. And none of that happens. Elisha tells him to go and bathe in a river. And all of this, this whole encounter, I think offers us really sort of three significant points for reflection today. One is that pride that Naaman brings into this encounter because he, he presumes to know how this should work and how this should happen. He also, in his pridefulness, makes several assumptions about the location, the people, and what healing and wholeness should look like. But then thirdly, Naaman also encounters distrust. When Naaman approaches the king of Samaria in the beginning of this encounter, the king of Samaria looks upon him, looks upon the situation, and immediately questions the motives. Naaman what are you on about? What is the ulterior motive here? How are you manipulating this situation to come out on top? But ultimately, all of that pridefulness, all of those assumptions, all of that distrust gets washed away and gets replaced with a fundamental sense of humility. Naaman comes away in his transformation, recognizing the larger reality and power of God, even as he comes from the place of worldly power and influence. And it's on that score that I think we have some significant connections to who we are as Americans. Because how often do we go into situations presuming that we know the answers, presuming that we know how something should work 
how it should play out, what the appropriate answers should be. How often do we make assumptions about how the world works and where the world works and what the powers and loci of powers are in the world? And how often do we also encounter distrust? How many different countries have we had less than stellar relationships with? How often it is today the case that when we go into situations, not unreasonably, countries we interact with say, well, what are you on about? What is your ulterior motive? How are you coming out on top? in this situation. Questions that are not without cause if we're being honest with ourselves. But ultimately, ultimately, like Naaman, we are invited in this transformation into a place of humility and a place of recognizing that God's reality and God's kingdom and God's work in this world is larger than us. And this all may sound rather negative, but I do want to acknowledge that, like Aram, there's a lot that is good about our country. There are a lot of things that we do well and right. But we don't do everything well and right. And we have, even in our goodness, our own set of afflictions. Interestingly, Naaman is described as having leprosy, but if you look at the Hebrew, the term used was a general term for a classification of a number of different afflictions. So we don't know exactly what it is that Naaman was suffering from. And I think there, too, that that's an important connection point for us because our afflictions are many. It's not just one thing that we suffer from, but we have a number of places where we could improve as a society, where we have fallen short as a society, where we haven't done things in the way that we should have. But all of that, all of that can be transformed. It can be transformed when we once again turn back to God when we once again stand in that place of humility, recognizing that we are not the end all be all, that God ultimately is the one to whom we turn. God ultimately is the one to whom we commit our lives. God ultimately is the power that we submit to and the power that wins out and the power that encompasses all. A couple of weeks ago, or I guess just last week, someone came to me and said, you know, I listened to your sermons very, very closely. And at least recently, your sermons have centered on this theme of love. Is there a reason for that? Is that just the context of the readings, or is it a more fundamental point that you're making? And the truth is that 99.9% .9 of the time, the homilies, sermons that I preach before you, will at some level and in some way come back to love. There's a clear rationale for that. As we were reminded by St. Paul last week in our reading from Galatians 5, what does Christ teach us but that the fundal, fundamental commandment, the first and great commandment, is to love. Love God and love your neighbor. So it is, at the end of the day, all about love. But love has many facets. And at times in our lives, there are ways in which we have failed to love, where we're called to reflect not on love itself, but the things that have caused us to fail in that love. 
And I want to suggest today, friends, today as we especially reflect on this national day of significance that we celebrate tomorrow, that as Americans, we often fail in humility. We are often Naaman. We often go into situations with prescriptive solutions, with assumptions and preconceived notions about how things should go and how the world should work, when in fact maybe what we should be doing is listening more significantly, approaching these circumstances with an openness and a heart, love, centeredness that allows us to learn, allows us to be transformed, allows us to be healed and renewed. So today, as we think about that, today, as we connect ourselves to Naaman, who are our Samarias? Where are those places and who are those people to whom we might go to reestablish that wholeness? Who are the voices unheard? Who are the voices ignored? And how, through them, might we hear more significantly the voice of God and experience more significantly the ultimate transforming and healing power of his presence in our lives. Questions that may be answered differently by each one of us, but I think an important foundational question for us to hear and reflect on today. Who are our Samarias? And how can we humbly and with an open heart, hear the voice of God in them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Standing together, let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <clears throat> In peace we pray to you, Lord God for all people in their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For 
for the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Mary Ann, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of the, in this congregation. For those in immediate need of prayer, Bob Adkins, Kathleen Bayer, Alicia and Bob Better, the Brandhover family, Ellen Brewer, Kimberly Bronte, Tiana Bryant, Joe Currency, Lois Currency, Aaron Cherian, Arzu Yonk Endelman, Jonathan Endelman, Carl Engstrom, Carol Goodman, Jan Harris, Jeff Hoffrichter, Hugh Mace, Serge Markoff, Raphael Martins, Carolyn Mills, Ruth Partlow, Benjamin Ramey, John Rucker, Bartolomeo Torres, Danilo Torres, Ulice Torres, Victor Torres, the Torres family, John Ward, Jay Woodford, Bill and Penny Yates. For those who have ongoing need of prayer, Lib Kane, Helen Clark, Debbie and Walter Hall, Mary Grubb, Susan Shimanuki, Kendall Stewart, Romeo Thornton. For those serving in the military here and overseas, Lawrence Anyanwu, Chris Blair, Tony D'Amato, Carl Angstrom, Phil Gardner, Paul Gearing, and wife Charlotte, daughters Anna and Tori, Chris Henry, Paul Hyland, Mariah Hobson, Eric Cheneau, Jay Jones, Lauren Lettrick, Philip Mullenix, Rachel McGurk, Michael Prettyman, Eric Walker, David Zatelli. For those affected by COVID-19 and its variants, we pray for the ministries of this church, the Columbarium and John Brewer. <clears throat> we pray for families and members of our parish, Lori Mull, Karen and Steve Mullen, Sadi and Lonre Okishana and Temi, Peggy and Reed Owens, Mary and Tim Pacey, Judy Partlow, Donna and Steph Potish and Stephanie Rayaya Royce DeLauder. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And pray your name forever and ever. We pray for all those who have died, especially Barbara Jean Barlow, Michael Greenstein, Raymond Hawbaker, and Alicia Cresock, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. This morning we also offer prayers for our country. Almighty God, who hast given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusions, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. And do with the spirit of wisdom those to whom thy name, in thy name we entrust the authority of government that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to thy law we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail. All which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we offer a prayer for the oppressed. Look with pity, O Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land, who live with injustice, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to these, our neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, you are faithful to your people and do not permit them to be tempted beyond their ability. But with temptation you also make a way of escape 
so that they can bear it. We humbly entreat you to strengthen us, your servants, with your heavenly aid and keep us with your continual protection that we may evermore wait on you and never by any temptation be drawn away from you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. I now invite those of you who are celebrating anniversaries or birthdays or preparing to travel to come forward for a blessing. We'll have those of you with anniversaries on your right, uh, birthdays in the middle, and traveling on your left. Traveling, traveling, traveling. Very good, very good. Well, in case we have some folks who are joining us online who are preparing to celebrate an anniversary, let us pray for them together. O oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it has represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send, therefore, your blessing upon these, your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And for those who may be joining us online or part of our larger community who are celebrating birthdays this week, let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may thy peace, which passeth understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And for those who are traveling, let us pray. O God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation, and whose presence we find wherever we go. Preserve those who travel, surround them with your loving care, and protect them from every danger, and bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the peace. O oh God of peace, you have taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved, in quietness and confidence shall be our strength. By the might of your Spirit, lift us, we pray, to your presence, where we may be still and know that you are God. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, thank you all for being here. Please be seated for just a moment. We have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we have uh, very close now at hand our golf tournament coming up on July 11th. So that is a week from tomorrow. Thank you, those of you who have contributed either personally or contributed by get generating sponsorships from friends, neighbors, uh, uh, people that you uh, uh, 
conduct business with or, or patronize. Uh, so we are so very thankful and we're excited about that event coming up. It will be a great day. So uh, we're really looking forward to it. Also, I want to say a huge, 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 huge thank you to those of you who have helped with the Walker House this past week. Uh, so those of you who may not know, the Walker House is our home right here on the edge of the property, and we have had a tenant there for the last few years who moved out uh, in due part to the construction, or in part due to the construction, uh, but lots of things were left and, and a significant amount of cleaning needed to be done, um, and we have had a huge turnout, uh, a very thankful turnout. Um, I just want to read through quickly a list. Um, Deb Boyle, John Brewer, John Catlin, Mimi Catlin, Sandra Clark Jones, Catherine and Michael Conroy, uh, Laura Davis, Brandon Hill, Kim Hill, Tom Hill, Janet Lowe, Mike Lowe, Joyce Mason, and Peggy Owen. So thank you all very much for the huge work that you did to get it ready. Um, an upshot, this has been a huge blessing. So we found out that uh, our tenants, um, it, it, the construction project, among some other things, just made their, their continued presence untenable. Um, when we found out from them that they were moving out, we were a little bit nervous because who's going to rent a home in the midst of all of this? And almost the next day after we found that out, Bazudo, our construction company, rang us up and they said, hey, we heard that house might be empty. Could we rent it? And we said, absolutely. So as of uh, July 1, Vizudo is going to be renting from us and using uh, the house as kind of their base of operations for the construction project. Uh, so we are, we are incredibly, incredibly thankful that, um, that they've been able to support us uh, even more fully um, in that way as well. Um, there are uh, some additional parking updates. Mike has mentioned those in the newsletter this week, and I would encourage you to um, look at that. And then also some information uh, about the next book being read in the book study. Um, and then we have uh, uh, some other um, kind of events with uh, beautifying our worship space and some other requests uh, that I would point your attention to as well. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation and the calling of Israel to be your people in your word spoken through the prophets and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks to them, he, bro he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, which is for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Anne, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, 
and the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And for those of you who are worshiping from home, I invite you to pray this post-communion prayer with me. God of truth and love, we thank you for this act of spiritual communion, even as we long for the days of gathering and community to partake of your body and blood. Renew in us that which bonds us together, our faith and trust in you, so that we may be transformed and grow in faith and love of you. Amen. And I invite all of us together now to proclaim our declaration of mission. As a community of faith, let us go forward to bring others to Christ through worship, witness, and love for one another and our neighbor. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.